shocking that Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen are in such a severe recession. Increasingly severe, China's economy faces major challenges. Xi Jinping's dream is shattered. It's hard to save it with huge investment. This is the fourth ring road in Beijing at 7 o'clock in the evening. In my memory, I have never seen such smooth traffic flow on the north fourth ring road during rush hour. Anyway, except for SARS and the epidemic, I have never seen it since I came to Beijing. Such a big depression is rare. If you tell me the real situation in Shanghai now, you might not believe it. Many big companies are cutting salaries and laying off employees. Many small companies are struggling to survive on the verge of losses and bankruptcy, and many can no longer pay wages. In the past, the mall was packed with people on weekends, and now it's deserted, as if it's about to close. I tell you the current real situation in Shenzhen, which may seem unbelievable. Large companies are constantly laying off employees, small companies are closing down, and the houses are unrented. What is surprising is that Shenzhen's finances are also facing problems. There are two major signals. First, many places in Shenzhen have reduced district-level expenditures this year. Second, Shanghai's foreign trade has stalled. In the first four months of this year, Shanghai lost its position as the number one foreign trade city after nine consecutive years. When two super cities send out strange signals, it means that we don't have much room for redundancy. China's economy is in a slump, and the Beijing authorities have finally lost their composure. The political bureau of the CPC Central Committee held an emergency meeting and stopped promoting the bright prospects of China's economy, rarely admitting that there are problems in the economy. Rich people are fleeing in a low-key manner, and there is a trend of going abroad in Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. The life of ordinary people is becoming increasingly difficult, increasingly severe. China's economy faces major challenges. Ming Zhuzheng, professor emeritus of the Department of Political Science at National Taiwan University, recently said on the YouTube program, political and economic frontline that in addition to domestic economic problems, China is also facing increasing pressure from the international environment. Among them, the Sino-US trade war has had a huge impact on China's export-oriented economy. Since the outbreak of the trade war in 2018, the United States has imposed tariffs on many types of Chinese products, greatly compressing the market share of Chinese companies overseas. This has not only led to a decline in China's exports, but also prompted some manufacturing companies to transfer production to lower-cost countries such as Vietnam and India, further weakening China's global supply chain position. At the same time, the technological competition between China and the United States has also brought huge challenges to the Chinese economy. The United States has blocked China's access to high-tech products, such as advanced semiconductors and communication technologies, through a series of restrictive measures. This technological blockade has greatly restricted China's technological progress in areas such as 5G, artificial intelligence, and chip manufacturing, causing related companies to suffer unprecedented pressure and development bottlenecks. Not only the United States, but European countries are also becoming increasingly cautious about China. Although economic ties between the EU and China occupy an important position in the process of globalization, in recent years, Europe has raised more questions about China's policies on market access and technology protection. Chinese companies have entered the global market with a low-price competition strategy which has brought a great impact on European small and medium-sized enterprises, prompting the EU to increase its scrutiny of Chinese imports and gradually adopt more restrictive measures. In addition, the withdrawal of foreign capital is also a major test facing the Chinese economy. In recent years, more and more multinational companies have chosen to transfer production lines from China to other regions, which has not only weakened China's traditional advantages as the world factory, 
but also caused China to lose a lot of foreign exchange income and employment opportunities. In particular, a series of laws and regulations involving national security issued by China, such as the Counterespionage Law and the Data Security Law, have further triggered a crisis of confidence in the Chinese market environment for foreign-funded enterprises. Although these measures are aimed at strengthening national security protection, they have also caused more doubts from the outside world about the openness of the Chinese economy. Xi Jinping's dream is shattered. It's hard to save it with huge investment. U.S. media revealed that China is working hard to cope with the U.S. chip ban, trying to achieve semiconductor self-sufficiency, and spending $96.3 billion to support the industry. But key semiconductor equipment issues cannot be solved by just investing money. China faces great difficulties in breaking through the technological ceiling. CNBC reported that since the United States implemented a strict export ban in October 2022, the Dutch government has also banned semiconductor equipment giant ASML from exporting advanced equipment to China. In order to cope with the restrictions, China has spent a lot of money to support the semiconductor industry and tried to break through the chip ban imposed by the United States and its allies. Since semiconductor equipment is key to China's promotion of the localization of the chip industry, CNBC estimates that the scale of China's three major national funds to support the semiconductor industry is as high as $96.3 billion. Last week, China announced that its latest exposure machine can support 65 nanometer resolution, referring to a process node of about 65 nanometers, which is an improvement over the 90 nanometers developed in 2022, but it is still far behind ASML's advanced exposure machine. Leping Huang, managing director of Huatai Securities, said that going from the current 65 nanometers to ASML's latest deep ultraviolet exposure machine requires major technological breakthroughs. In addition, ASML is still selling unregulated products to China. In the second quarter of this year, ASML's sales revenue to Chinese customers almost doubled from 17% in the fourth quarter of 2022 to 49%. John Lee of East West Futures, a consulting firm based in Singapore, bluntly stated that this growth shows that the Chinese industry believes they have no viable local alternatives yet. Paul Triolo, partner and senior vice president for China at the U.S.-based DGA Group, pointed out that it would be a daunting task for any Chinese company to recreate the advanced exposure machine equipment that ASML has spent decades developing and commercializing. He bluntly stated that no matter what equipment Chinese companies produce, it is unlikely to fully replicate ASML's achievements, and the technical level cannot be matched. Camille Boulinois, deputy director of the U.S.-based Rhodium Group, also said that in the field of electric vehicles, China's subsidies have stimulated demand and created a large and protected market for domestic companies to expand rapidly. But in the complex chip industry, breaking through the technological ceiling is much more difficult. Foreign media believe that key semiconductor equipment issues cannot be solved by investing money, and it is difficult for China to break through the technological ceiling. China's local economy is collapsing. Fuyang City in Hangzhou has collapsed and been taken over. China's local economy is collapsing. The finances of Hangzhou's Fuyang City have collapsed and been taken over. Recently, it was reported that the finances of Fuyang City, Hangzhou, Zhejiang province collapsed, and it is now under the trusteeship of Hangzhou. China's economy continues to decline. Yunnan province also announced that all civil servants' salaries in the province will be suspended. The ex-account Daniel Fang posted a message today, 26, stating that Hangzhou's economy is terrible. Daniel Fang shared an article from a Chinese netizen mentioning that five years ago, the rent for the EFC office at the Chuangjing Road subway entrance in Hangzhou was 2.8 wen per square meter per day while today, the rent at the Oak Center in the same location is 1.2 yuan. This office is part of Hangzhou's second iconic CBD in future science and technology city, close to Alibaba. As for other offices, especially in large parks, many are being offered rent-free because landlords can save on business fees by renting them out.
Many new companies lack offices, and numerous companies have either closed down or reduced their office space. The netizen noted that half of his office floor has been vacant for six months. His office is located in Hangzhou, 100 meters from Yongfu subway station and 350 meters from Ali Shichi Park. The fact that such a prime location has remained vacant for half a year shows how bad the economy is. The netizen claimed that to cut costs, he considered laying off employees. Ultimately, on Monday, he laid off 15 staff from the live broadcasting department, six from marketing, and retained only one employee for design and customer service. He lamented that the current economic situation is dire. Daniel Fang also mentioned that various regions of China have begun laying off investment promotion offices. He speculated that this could be because there is no money to support these offices or no one is being attracted to them. He believes this is a sign that China's era of economic prosperity is gone forever. Additionally, a fiscal expenditure and income chart from Grongwei shows that from January to July, most regions in China are facing fiscal gaps, further highlighting the worsening economic situation. Shanghai distributes 500 million yuan in coupons. Netizens say China's economy is beyond saving. With the National Day holiday approaching, the Shanghai Municipal Government announced it will issue consumer vouchers worth 500 million RMB, about 71.22 million USD, starting Saturday, September 28th, to stimulate the service industry. However, Shanghai citizens do not seem to appreciate it, as the vouchers come with restrictions such as full amount discount and first come, first served. Many netizens believe the government is not being sincere. Scholars argue that Shanghai's consumer vouchers are akin to discount vouchers. They are not universally issued and have set consumption thresholds, so their benefits may be limited. China's economy is weak, and people are generally downgrading their consumption, even in first-tier cities. On Wednesday, September 25th, the Shanghai municipal government announced it will invest 500 million RMB in municipal funds to issue Happy Shanghai consumer vouchers to four major service sectors, 3.6 trillion RMB for the catering industry, 90 million RMB for the accommodation industry, 30 million RMB for the film industry, and 20 million RMB for sports activities. The first batch of vouchers will be available starting this Saturday, However, there are thresholds for using the vouchers, such as 50 yuan off for dining purchases of 300 yuan or more, and 300 yuan off for accommodation purchases of 1,200 yuan or more, resembling department store anniversary discounts. According to official media, Liberation Daily, on September 26th, these vouchers will be issued in two phases on a first-come, first-served basis through four different payment and ticketing platforms. The Taobaoization of consumption vouchers has sparked public outcry in Shanghai. Shanghai citizens are not optimistic about this measure. Ms. Yang, a Shanghai resident who wished to remain anonymous, criticized the Shanghai municipal government in an interview with Voice of America, stating, Taobao has been used too much and has begun to reflect reality. It is too funny. There is no sincerity at all, and it is impossible to promote consumption. She also expressed concern that the Shanghai municipal government might use taxpayers' money to frivolously subsidize businesses in disguise. Chinese social media platform Weibo also reflected doubts. Shanghai netizen Happy Miracle 9 criticized the government for saying, If you're reluctant to issue it, then don't. You want to stimulate people's consumption, but are unwilling to release it. Another Shanghai netizen, Kids Mom Dad, complained that cash is more useful than consumption coupons, writing, Give out money. Brother, you always want to get the biggest return with the least expenditure. You're being foolish. A third Shanghai netizen, Wan Do Duo Do O, questioned the goodwill of the Shanghai municipal government, asking, Why are they always secretive about issuing them, announcing subsidies without telling you where to get them? Even people from other provinces and cities criticize the Shanghai municipal government's so-called people-friendly policies. A Weibo user named Hei Curry Gai San from Guangdong wrote, 
the local government, Shanghai, did it on its own. They wanted to stimulate consumption but didn't have much money, fearing they would offend other regions and the central government. A Shanghai resident noted, the Chinese economy is declining daily, and these consumer stimulus packages from the government can only slow the collapse of the domestic economy. They cannot save it. This is because people are facing a wave of unemployment and bankruptcy and no longer have a source of income. People want to improve their spending power rather than increase consumption. Wu Sechi, director of the Taiwan Think Tank Center for Chinese Studies in Taipei, stated that Shanghai's issuance of discount-type consumer coupons aims to boost the economy in specific areas through targeted consumption, but the benefits may be extremely limited. The vouchers adopt a first-come, first-served model rather than a universal issuance, locking in those with spending power to achieve immediate digital performance, which aligns with the short-term operational inertia of the CCP's rule. However, setting a consumption threshold may lead to low public acceptance. Furthermore, he said Shanghai's consumption is anchored in the life and entertainment industry. The intended model is, People consume first, stores offer discounts, and then vouchers are used to receive government subsidies. However, unscrupulous stores might increase prices before offering discounts to maintain higher profits. If such situations arise, consumers will be disadvantaged and won't enjoy any real benefits. Whether stores that offer discounts will ultimately receive government subsidies is also uncertain. Wu Seiji told VOA, Chinese people do not want to increase consumption now. They want to improve their consumption capacity. This is a completely different concept. This consumption voucher policy may be like a stone thrown into water, having no effect. China's current structural problems are very serious, and consumption cannot be resolved merely by consumption. Wu Seiji remarked that Shanghai, as a leading international city with many leading industries, relying on consumption vouchers to stimulate the economy, indicates that its status as China's economic leader has been shaken, suggesting that the economies of other Chinese cities may be worse.